Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. For those of you who have been at, at our briefings before, you know a little bit about EESI, but for those who may not have, let me just tell you that our organization was formed by bipartisan uh, a group of members of Congress back in 1984 for the purpose of providing uh, more resources to policymakers as they tried to learn about, to struggle in terms of uh, finding out what are the kinds of solutions, what are the kinds of questions that we should be asking with regard to environmental and energy issues. So that has been a very important part of our mission for the last 35 years uh, to provide those kinds of resources to policymakers. Uh, we do a whole series of briefings every year on science, technology, and policy issues that are before the Congress or that we anticipate will be coming before the Congress. So we work on a variety of issues. Please feel free to follow up with me or with any of our staff um, at any time. But for today's topic, climate change in the American mind. We are very, very glad to be able to talk about this whole issue, to have a, a very special speaker with us this afternoon uh, who is well known um, and has been for many years now for the very fascinating and thorough and thoughtful uh, work that he has been doing at, as uh, director of the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication, which is also part of Yale's uh, School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. So Dr. Anthony Leiserwitz has been doing, as I said, this kind of polling communication analysis, really searching in, in terms of looking at these issues, both uh, internationally as well as domestically. Really, really important issues to try and understand better what is making up the fabric of thought with regard to the American public, uh, with regard to the public globally, in terms of thinking about climate change, what's involved, what does this represent for different kinds of policy issues, how are people thinking about it. And of course, we know that as we have entered into the third month of this new Congress, that there is a lot of conversation on Capitol Hill with regard to climate change. There have been numerous bills that have been, been introduced. There are any number of hearings that have been held and that will be held over the course of the next several months. There is a whole new select committee on climate change that has been set up here in the House. So the thing is, it is an important topic. People are seeing all sorts of things happening across the country in terms of extreme weather events. So I think that it is becoming much more top of mind uh, in terms of conversations, articles that people are becoming aware of across the country. But what do we really know about American public opinion? How should we think about it? What does, um, what, what are we thinking? How does that manifest itself? What do we learn from that? What are the questions we should be asking? So to help us learn more about all of that and then to answer all of your questions, uh, I am delighted to introduce Dr. Anthony Leiserwitz. Well, thank you very much, Carol, and thank you to you and to the EESI for the invitation to come down and uh, uh, have a conversation with you all uh, today. Uh, just to extend a little bit, so I direct the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication, and just to give you a little more insight as to what we do, we basically try to study mass societies and, and understand how are they responding to climate change and other global environmental challenges. So what do people understand and misunderstand about the causes, the consequences, and the potential solutions. How do they perceive the risks, so the likelihood and severity of different types of impacts, from sea level rise to human health impacts uh, to economic impacts and so on? What kinds of policies do people support or oppose? And then what kinds of behaviors are people engaged in around climate change and energy? And by behavior, we look at how people use waste or conserve energy at home and on the road, 
Secondly is consumer behavior. To what extent do they, will they prefer the products and services that are more climate friendly? But also, interestingly, to what extent are they willing to reward or punish companies for their actions? And I would just take a moment to say that Americans generally are more willing to vote with their pocketbooks than they are to vote at the ballot box on the issue of climate change. And that's actually an important lever of change in today's society. A third area is social behavior, uh, in particular communication. Uh, do we talk about this issue? Or why don't we talk about this issue? Because that's often the case. Uh, and then last but not least is political behavior. Uh, what leads people to become engaged citizens, to actually roll up their sleeves and say, I'm not going to stand on the sideline and watch the world burn. I want to get involved and do what I can to try to affect larger systemic structural political change. But in the end, we are geeky scientists, so our ultimate question is answering why. What are the underlying psychological, cultural, and political reasons why some people get really engaged with these issues? Others are kind of apathetic, and others are downright hostile and dismissive. Um, and then, as Carol alluded to, we work at a lot of different scales. Uh, here I'm going to talk about climate change in the American mind. Uh, I'll show you a little bit of the work that we've been doing at uh, state and local levels, because, of course, that's where so much of the action is going to happen, regardless of what happens in D.C. Um, but we've also done a lot of work internationally as well. We did the first ever studies in China, the first ever study in India, and then we partnered with the Gallup World Poll for several years to study this in about 130 countries around the world. So when we get to q and I'm happy to go to whatever level people want to go. Um, but for today, I'm going to mostly just talk about here in the United States. Um, okay, so let me just start, and I'm going to, I can't help myself, I'm a professor. So I'm just going to say that it would be wonderful it would be great if all Americans could have a whole semester-long course devoted to climate change, maybe taught at Yale University. Okay, climate change 101. Uh, you know, a full semester course to really understand here's how the climate system works, here are the causes, here are what are the consequences, here are what the potential solutions. Okay, that would be great. But that's never going to happen. That's never going to happen. We're talking about a population of over 300 million people. Okay? Now, I am not saying that, in fact, there aren't millions of Americans who do want those kinds of details okay? and are asking those questions. And I say it's incumbent upon us in the climate science community to go more than halfway to try to meet them and try as best we can to answer their questions. Okay? But that's not most people. Most people are too busy with other issues. They've got too much else going on in their lives. They're trying to get their kids to school, all the other things that are pressing on us. Okay? They don't have the background. They don't have the training to really get into the details. So the core question then becomes, what do people need to know? Well, just imagine with me for a moment that there's limited shelf space in most people's heads for this particular issue, or frankly, any of the other issues that we deal with in this body. So what would you need them to know? Okay. Do they need to know exactly how the carbon cycle works? Probably not. Okay. Do they need to know exactly how many parts per million of CO2 is in the atmosphere at any given time? Probably not. Okay. And through the course of our work and uh, some of our colleagues around the country, we think we've actually identified five key ideas, okay. five ideas that at least are a baseline, at least a starting point that we would hope all people could understand because it turns out those five key ideas are strongly associated with support for policy and willingness to take individual action. Um, moreover, we've boiled those five ideas down to just ten words, but a friend of mine here in Congress actually uh, is a haiku master and she converted it to eleven words, so I'm going to give you the longer version, which is eleven words, and here we go. And I'm sorry that you have to look on the sides. It's a fabulous screen right behind you, but you can't see it. Um, here we are. Scientists agree. It's real. It's us. It's bad. But there's hope. Now that seems deceptively simple. Okay? But actually these are what I would call meta-ideas. These are ideas that in fact you can talk about in hundreds and hundreds of different instances and examples and ways. Okay? Here are all the ways that we know that the scientific community has reached a consensus that climate change is happening in human cause and ha presents really serious risks for humanity, as well as non-humanity species. Okay? Here are all the ways that we know that it's actually happening. Here are all the dozens of ways that we know that this time it's us. Yes, of course the climate has changed naturally over millions of years, of course. But this time it's different. 
It's not the sun. It's not orbital dynamics. It's not volcanoes. This time, it's the result of human, particularly industrial, uh, activities. Okay? It's bad. Here are the thousands of examples of how it's already bad now and going to get much, much worse if we continue on the current path of pollution. And then perhaps most importantly, this last one, which is that there's hope. And this actually resonates with a deep, huge literature uh, in the social sciences and psychology in particular about that it's not enough to understand the threat, the risk, the seriousness of the issue itself, and this is for any issue, but you have to couple that with an understanding of what's called efficacy. That's the psychological term, which basically means that you know that there are things that can be done, that you or we have the ability to do those things, and most importantly, that if we do them, it will make a difference. Okay? It's not enough to just communicate, big problem, big problem, big problem, be scared, be worried, let's do, or, you know, let's be worried about it, let's be fearful. Okay? And, and I will be pretty critical right now of the climate community and, frankly, the environmental community, and we can keep going, uh, that we too often stop there. And don't couple it with a sense of, here's what we can, in fact, do. And more importantly, here's what people are actually doing right now. Because the fact is that there are amazing stories all around us, all across the country and all around the world, of people who are already taking action. Okay? So it's important to have both. So deceptively simple, um, but I think really uh, important things that every time you're talking about that climate change is real or that it's us or that it's bad, you're trying to reinforce these basic fundamental ideas in people's heads. Okay, so how are we doing right now in the United States? So, as Carol mentioned, we've been uh, studying American public opinion on this for many, many years, and I'm going to show you data from an ongoing process, a project that we call Climate Change in the American Mind. These are nationally representative surveys we conduct twice a year, every spring, every fall, uh, and have been doing that for over a decade. So I'm going to show you the trends that we've seen over the past decade, uh, and we'll talk a bit about that. So again, with this in mind, how are we doing here in the United States? Well, on the far left, you see where we started this project back in the November of 2008, and then all the way forward to the far right, you see the most recent study we published uh, back in December, so just a few months ago. We're actually in the field right now, so we'll have an update to this in just a few weeks. Um, and what you can see is that basically we had a high water mark back in 2008. This is right about the time that we were talking about the last major shot at, uh, at national climate legislation, the Waxman-Markey bill. Uh, and basically, public engagement with this issue had been growing and growing and growing throughout the 2000s until it kind of hit this high water mark. And then you can see there was a substantial drop, a 14 percentage point drop in acceptance that the problem is even real. And by the way, Pew's data shows the same trend, Gallup's data shows the same trend, our other academic uh, friends and colleagues all show the same thing. So a big drop bottoming out in 2010. And if we want, if people want to ask questions about that particular moment in history, I'm happy to do that, but I'm going to save it for the Q&A. Uh, then pretty, you know, stayed pretty low for quite a while until just the past few years when it, we've seen a real uptick. And we're now at an all-time high, 73% of Americans who accept that climate change is real. Yay, 73%, except it's only 73%. If we were in Japan, it would be over 95%. Okay? So the U.S. is actually a laggard in terms of public engagement or at least even acceptance that the problem is real, uh, let alone a human cause or a serious problem. But with human cause in mind, how are we doing there? Well, not quite as well. Again, same basic trend, big drop uh, from 2008 to 2010. Uh, All-time high again, 62% of Americans understand that it's human caused. And those that believe it's natural is at an all-time low now. So that's good, but it's still only 62%. And that's important because, you know, if it's not, if human activities are not helping to drive this issue, then why would we do things like regulate carbon dioxide or put a price on carbon or do all the things that, of course, people in Congress and in state legislators around the country are trying to do to address the core uh, cause of this, which is carbon pollution and other greenhouse gases? So maybe we should be spending money on resilience and adaptation to extreme weather, okay, but I don't understand why we would need to do these other kinds of policies. 
And then another really important measure, and this stands in for a whole bunch of other risk perception items, which I'll show you a few in a few minutes, uh, is worry. Now, this we actually saw a really big jump in the past year. So from March of last year to December of last year, uh, an eight-point jump in those Americans who were very worried about climate change. That's pretty remarkable. We rarely see moves like that uh, in this kind of uh, public opinion data. Uh, so that's actually pretty remarkable, and we think actually a lot of that has to do with the extreme weather that happened last year. Uh, also very importantly, a couple major scientific reports that came out, uh, both the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the, you know, international body of scientists that review all the latest research released a major report on what it would take to hold global temperatures below one and a half degrees Celsius and basically said it's doable, but it's going to be really hard. Okay? And that was a heck of a wake up call. Likewise, the National Climate Assessment was released, uh, or actually released on a Friday after Thanksgiving, which, as most people know, that's usually the day that you want to take out the trash. Um, and if you don't want the media to pay attention to a story, that's the perfect time to do it, especially after Thanksgiving. But, you know, that kind of backfired uh, in the sense that a lot of the media saw that and was like, hey, what are they doing? They must be trying to hide this. So it actually, ironically, generated a lot more media co coverage. It's, it's very funny how these things work. So anyway, those stories got a lot of attention. And again, this is, of course, the federal government and federal scientists reviewing the literature about what we know about these impacts here in the United States and saying it's already having a significant impact uh, in the United States. Um, that together with media coverage, you put those pieces together and if you'll excuse the expression, it's a perfect storm. Okay? So we think that's a, a good part of what's going on there. But still, even with that, only 29% of Americans are very worried about this issue. So why aren't we more worried about it? Okay. Well, what we've seen dating all the way back to the beginning of these, this study and before is one thing in particular, that many Americans continue to think of climate change as a distant problem, distant in time, that the impacts won't be felt for a generation or more, and distant in space. This is about polar bears or maybe some developing countries but not the United States, not my state, not my community, not my friends, not my family, not me. And as a result, it's psychologically distant. It's one of those issues of a thousand other issues that's out there, and maybe I kind of wish somebody would do something about it, but I don't see why it's important. I don't see why it's a priority. Okay. Another important thing that we learned early in this work is that, of course, Americans don't have a single viewpoint about climate change or, frankly, any important issue in American life. Um, and so then people tend to very simplistically say, oh, well, then, okay, there's climate change believers and climate change deniers. And that actually does real violence to the truth, too. Okay? What we found in our research is what we call global warming six Americas, six different parts of the public that are each quite different from each other and each have a very different starting point in engaging this issue. So let me introduce you to your fellow Americans, categorized this way. Um, this data is from uh, uh, 2018. I'll show you the trends in a moment because we've been tracking this now for uh, t over a decade. Uh, the first group is 29% of Americans, what we call the alarmed. These are people who are absolutely convinced it's happening, it's human caused, it's urgent, they strongly support action, um, it's a high pri voting priority, but they don't know what they can do. They don't know what they can do as individuals to address this issue. They don't know what we can do collectively to address this issue. And again, from a communication standpoint, I think our community, the climate community, has done a better job of communicating the problem than they have the solutions. Secondly is a group we call the concerned. These are people who say, yeah, it's happening, it's human caused, it's serious, but again, they tend to think of it as distant in time and space. So they do support action, but they don't see it as particularly urgent or as a particularly high uh, national priority. Third group at 17% is the group we call the cautious, and you can think of these people as still on the fence. Not really sure, is it real, is it not? Is it human, is it natural? Is it serious, or is it kind of overblown? They're paying attention, but just really haven't made up their mind, they're a bit confused. Then comes a small, but I think very important group that we call the disengaged, that's 5% of the country. 
These are people who say, you know, I think I once heard that word, global warming, but I don't know anything about it. I, I don't know what the causes are, I don't know what the consequences are, I don't know what the solutions are. Okay? They, believe it or not, there's about 5% who really just don't know much. And I'll just take a moment to go global. This actually is far larger at the global scale. What we found, and the data is a little old now, but it's, I think, hasn't changed that much. What we found is with the Gallup World Poll is that about 4 out of 10 human beings or adults on Earth have never heard of climate change. And that rises to two-thirds or even three-quarters in particular countries, like Bangladesh. Okay? Poster child of climate change vulnerability, and yet about two-thirds of Bangladeshis have never heard of it. Likewise in India, about two-thirds have never heard of it. Which is not to say that they're not keenly aware that the that weather patterns of temperature and precipitation are changing. They know that. They are very clear about that. And in fact, what we found in a study in India is that when we just gave them a one-sentence description of how climate change is affecting weather patterns, immediately over 70 percent of Indians say, yeah, that's happening, and yeah, I'm really worried about it, uh, and yes, I'm supportive of my government taking action, okay? Because their lives literally depend on it. We're often talking about people who are still subsistence agriculture, for, uh, as an example, okay? So they're keenly aware of the changes. They just lack the notion or the idea, the concept of climate change to either make sense of the effects and the impacts that they're already witnessing, or they lack the concept of climate change to help inform the decisions that they're making right now. Okay? How do these countries, what, what crops do we grow? Where do we build our new cities? To what thresholds should we be building? Our bridges, our roads, our buildings? Where should we be putting our hospitals and our schools? Okay? These are really big decisions. And if you're not making those decisions today with climate change in mind, you're more vulnerable. You will be more vulnerable moving forward. Sorry, that was a bit of an aside. Um, but that's 5% of the United States. Then comes a group, 9%, that we call the doubtful. Uh, these are people who say, you know, I don't think it's real, but if it is, it's natural, just a natural cycle. Nothing humans have anything to do with, so I don't think about it that much, and I certainly don't perceive it as much of a risk. Then uh, uh, at the end here is 9% uh, the dismissive. And these are people who are firmly convinced it's not happening, it's not human, it's not a serious problem, and most of whom literally are telling us that they're conspiracy theorists. Uh, they say it's a hoax, it's scientists making up data, it's a UN plot to take away American sovereignty, it's a get-rich scheme by Al Gore and his friends, and many, many other such conspiracy-oriented narratives. Okay? Now, importantly, they're 9%. They're only 9% but they're a really loud 9%. They're really vocal 9%, and I have to say they're pretty well represented in this body right here in Washington, D.C. Okay. So they've actually tended to make themselves seem like they're half or more of the country when they're not. They're less than 10%, but they're really loud. They're good communicators. Okay. They're very happy to tell you what they think. Okay. All right, so what's been happening in the trends? So here you can see what's been going on over the past five years, and basically big changes. So the alarmed are, have increased by 15 percentage points. The concerned are up two points. The cautious are down six. The disengaged are still about the same at, uh, with a slight increase of 2 percent. The doubtful are down six, and the dismissive are down five. Okay? This is another way of kind of getting at the larger political climate of climate change in the United States. And one other thing I'll point you to is that if you look in 2013, um, the alarmed were exactly the same proportion as the dismissive at 14%. Okay? And these two groups are really important. Okay? Overall public opinion has a very you know, limited influence on policy making. Okay? It's important to have public with you and support it. Like you don't want to go against something that the public is absolutely against because you might well get whacked for that. But you know, general support, it's, it's, it's silent permission to act, but it's not a motivation to act. But issue publics, that subset of the, of the population that is highly engaged with a particular issue and is literally going to get up in your face and in your grill at home in Washington, uh, on the airwaves, in op-eds and so on, those are the people who tend to have the greatest influence from the public side. Obviously, there are many influences on decision making in this town. But at least from the public standpoint, those issue publics are really important. Back in 2013, 
uh, the alarmed and the dismissive were the same at 14 percent. Today, the alarmed are 29 percent and the dismissive are 9. The alarmed outnumber the dismissive more than 3 to 1. Okay. That's a pretty big shift. And since we're here in D.C., you got to, I mean, all the Six America stuff is great. It's very helpful for thinking about climate change in particular, but let's face it, it's also a partisan issue. So let's look at how, uh, what's been happening in the trends of is climate change a high, very high priority for the President and Congress? And you can very quickly see the trends. The blue line is Democrats. Uh, and we've seen a really big shift, a really strong upward surge among Democrats in saying that climate change should be a very high priority. There's also an upward surge among independents, but clearly not as strong. And then among Republicans, it's been pretty flat. Okay. So yes, we are polarized on this. And I'll come back to that in just a second. Now, I know this is a very complicated slide, and I do expect you all to memorize it because there will be a quiz at the end. Um, but really, I want to make just a couple key points that will be very simple. So you've all seen these questions. And I think this is actually one of the most important questions uh, survey researchers can ask, is how big of a priority is this issue? Because there's a lot of competing issues on the agenda, right? We all know that. So which are the ones that are at the top tier? Which are the ones that are going to get the most attention from a member of Congress, the president, the, uh, the agencies, and so on? So what we've all seen for many, many years is climate change tends to score pretty low in the list of national priorities. Now here, this is a question we asked a year ago where we explicitly asked, how important will these 28 different issues be in determining your vote for Congress in this last fall's congressional elections. Okay? And climate change was at number 15. So that's basically a lot better than it has been in the past. But that's not a hot top priority issue, let's be clear. Okay? It's 15th. Uh, but then it gets much more interesting when you break it down by liberal Democrats, moderate conservative Democrats, liberal moderate Republicans, and conservative Republicans. Among conservative Republicans, there on the, the, uh, on the right, is uh, global warming is 28th out of 28, dead last. Okay? And it's not a whole lot higher among liberal moderate Republicans. And among moderate conservative Democrats, it's in the middle of the pack. But then it gets interesting when you look among liberal Democrats, because climate change was number four, and protecting the environment was number three. Okay? That is a top tier issue. And I think that's why you started to see climate change appearing in certain congressional races last fall. Okay. In other words, the base of one of our two major political parties has reached a consensus that this is one of their top priority issues. And in fact, I've seen some uh, more recent uh, polling data that suggests it's actually now number two, especially because with the, as the memories of Parkland uh, have faded, that has dropped in public priorities. Okay? So I don't think it's an accident. I don't think it's a coincidence that every candidate currently running for the Democratic nomination for president has already come out and said, I am for climate change action. Okay? And even within there, we've got a spectrum of people f who are saying that they are for climate change all the way out to Jay Inslee, who's literally running his entire campaign on climate change. I think this is going to continue to play out over the next couple of years. Okay? And it's playing out, of course, uh, has been playing out this week uh, here in Congress. OK, so yes, we are polarized on this issue. I know this is groundbreaking. Nobody knew that we were really <laughs> divided on climate change in this country. Um, but I don't want to leave you with the impression that, it, that we're totally hopelessly divided. Because when it comes to some of the solutions, we've actually already reached a social consensus. And that's particularly true on clean energy. So here I'm just pulling a few out. Um, uh, we see overwhelming and have all along very strong support for funding more research into renewable energy uh, uh, sources such as solar and wind power. Okay? Almost 9 out of 10 Americans support that including a large majority of conservative Republicans. Okay? I've got to tell you, as a survey researcher, it's hard to write a question that you get 9 out of 10 Americans to agree on. I dare say if I asked, do you like apple pie, I wouldn't get that kind of number. Okay? Um, Americans are really supportive of this, and I think this is one of the things that you're already seeing showing up here in policy proposals. I think just yesterday or the day before, Lamar Alexander over in the Senate is promoting a Manhattan-style project to 
put a lot of research money into clean energy and battery storage. Okay? Guess what? That's one of the things that within the Republican Party, there's already a consensus that that's an important and worthwhile thing to do. Okay? And likewise, providing tax credits for people who purchase energy efficient vehicles and solar panels. Americans want to be part of this transition to clean energy. They want some help in doing it, but they want to be part of it. Regulating CO2 as a, as, uh, as a pollutant, again, uh, strong support for that across the country, even among conservative Republicans. And I'll come back to more policies here in a second. But I also just want to give you a sense of the, of the trend on that funding renewable energy research. Um, not only is it high, but you can see that the real movement over the past few years has been among conservative Republicans, who've increased their support for this by 30 percentage points. Wow, 30 percentage points over the past five years, from 50 percent support to now 80. Another, uh, sw switching gears here, another very, very common message or discourse that we always hear right around this time, uh, and it's come up in the climate space over and over, it's come up in other environmental issues over and over, uh, is the question that's actually one of the oldest uh, polling questions on the environment. I mean, really goes way, 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 way back. And you all know this question as in, um, which do you prefer, protecting the, in, the environment, even if it harms the economy and costs jobs, or growing the economy, even if it has environmental uh, uh, devastation or, or damage, okay? Uh, I've always hated this question, okay? It's a zero-sum, either-or, false choice. Okay, so we actually have rewritten the question, and we've tried it with climate change, we've tried it with the environment, and I'm going to show you here around the clean energy transition, uh, that it's not an argument that most Americans actually agree with. That when asked, uh, you know, how much, well, let me actually read it myself. Do you think government policies intended to transition away from fossil fuels towards clean energy will improve economic growth and provide new jobs? reduce economic growth and cost jobs, or have no effect. Okay. And what we see is that overwhelmingly Americans say it will either grow the economy uh, or have no effect. 58% say it will actually improve growth and jobs. 23% say not much at all. Only 18% of Americans really buy into this uh, argument that it will destroy our economy. Okay. I always uh, am amused at the hyperventilated uh, you know, catastrophic uh, uh, discourse I hear about millions of jobs destroy our economy. It's exactly the same language that, for instance, the auto company said when, it was, when they were told, you're going to have to put seat belts in cars. Oh, you can't do that. It will destroy our industry. It's going to cost us millions of jobs. Last time I checked, we're still buying cars. Um, so anyway, uh, and that turns out to be true even among conservative Republicans. 59% uh, say it will either improve the economy or have no effect. Um, just because this issue has been uh, very current lately, uh, here I'm going to show you the, the data about support for the Green New Deal. Now, we did this back, back in the day, before Markey, before AOC uh, put their proposal together, as we were just starting to get uh, hearing about this thing. And well, first of all, we found is that, of course, 80% of Americans said, I'd never heard of it. Okay. But then we asked, with a, you know, a description of at least some of the aspirational goals of this, what do you think? And overwhelmingly, Americans say, yeah, I want those, right? Per generate 100% of the nation's electricity from clean renewable sources within 10 years. Upgrade the energy grid, buildings and transportation infrastructure. Increase energy efficiency. Invest in research uh, and development. Provide training for jobs. I mean, of course, people love that. Okay. And I've seen more recent work that actually starts to attach price tags to it and even starts to break it out in like which of the specific policies you support. And it is going down in particular. One of the things we warned back in December when we first released this is that this was all before anybody had uh, started to launch attacks on this basic idea. Okay? And these numbers were going to change. And they are changing. But interestingly, they're not changing that much, at least not so far. We'll, we'll keep an eye on it. Um, but anyway, I know there's been a lot of uh, discussion around uh, the Green New Deal, especially yesterday. Um, so just wanted to make sure I touched on it. 
But at least one of the themes in the Green New Deal is this idea of trying to make the shift to clean renewable energy as quickly as possible. Now, this one isn't in 10 years. This is in <laughs> by 2050, so we're, we're giving people a little bit longer. Um, but what we see, again, is that overwhelmingly people support this basic idea. Okay? And I, I know this is hard for people to believe, but there's no inherent love of coal, oil, and gas in America. Okay? People want the lights to go on. Okay? They want to be able to go from point A to point B. And for those that actually have studied it and know anything about it, they'd like to go from point A to point B a lot faster and a lot more fun because an electric motor is so much more powerful than an internal combustion engine. If you haven't driven an electric car, buckle up. Okay? <laughs> Thank God for those seatbelts. Okay. Uh, moreover, we've even asked, you know, how might it affect your, your, own, uh, your own likelihood to vote for a candidate? Uh, whether they support that transition or not. And again, overwhelmingly people say, yes, I'm, I want to support candidates that, that want to lead this. Okay, so the other thing I want to really end with is uh, a tool that came out of a lot of the discussions that came out from a lot of these presentations that I give around the country because people would say, hey, you know, this national data is really helpful. The Six Americas framework really helps me better understand my audiences um, and so on. But I'm trying to run a campaign in Kansas. Can you tell me about Kansas? And the answer was always no, because no one's ever provided me support to go do a study in Kansas. Um, and of course, you could just multiply that by at the state level, at the congressional district level, et cetera, et cetera, at the city level. So in response, we were able to help uh, uh, to advance and pioneer some of the, this really amazing new uh, statistical uh, tools that have emerged in the past few years that have allowed us to basically build models that estimate public opinion for all 50 states, all 435 congressional districts, all 1,000 uh, largest cities, and 3,000 plus counties across the country. And moreover, of course, we don't just trust a model. We then actually did independent surveys in four states and two cities to then compare how well that model's estimates compared against actual survey results. The short answer to this, and it's published, so happy to, if anybody wants to look at the details, is that they match at about 97, 98 percent. I mean, wow. Okay. As a social scientist, I go, wow, that's like natural science. Um, okay. uh, and in fact, we're not even sure which is more accurate, the model or the surveys, because any survey, of course, has a margin of error around it, usually of, say, plus or minus 3 percent. Um, so anyway, what do we see when we start to break that out? So let me drop out of this. And these are all publicly available here on our website. Uh, just look at Yale climate opinion maps. Uh, we've been doing this for several years. We just updated them with the 2018 data. Um, this is all open and available for anybody who wants to come take a look. So here's an example. Uh, and this is what we could always provide before. 61% of Americans are worried about global warming in 2018. Okay, that's useful, kind of. But in the end, people want to know what's going on much more locally. So let's go straight to the county level. Because what you suddenly can see is that there's far more variation going on in this country than we were otherwise aware of. I mean, I'll say as a scientist, it was like a biologist being given a microscope for the first time. You kind of knew there were things swimming around in the water, but you couldn't see them until you had uh, this new tool. So let me just take one of my favorite examples. Uh, not only is there a lot of variation around the country, but look at Texas. Okay? Texas kind of has this reputation of being like, deep red, very conservative, uh, you know, has been led by a couple climate-denying governors over the years, including Rick Perry. Um, doesn't seem like a place that you can have a very constructive conversation about climate change. Turns out that's not true. Okay? Those counties along the border are as or more worried about climate change as counties in California. Okay? Why? Latinos. Okay. In fact, we've done a whole set of other studies looking at this because the common wisdom is that only upper middle class, white, well-educated, latte-sipping liberals care about climate change. It's not true. Okay. Latinos are the demographic that actually care more about climate change than just about anybody else in America. They're more convinced it's real, that it's human caused, they're more worried about it, they're more supportive of policy action.
So you can begin to see that these kinds of analyses suddenly reveal patterns that we just weren't aware of before. So just to, because I know people tend to here tend to be more interested in this level, let's switch to congressional districts. So, okay, so I made the point earlier about how climate change seems distant. Well, here's how Americans in every congressional district in the country think about uh, will global warming harm future generations? There isn't a congressional district in the country where there's not a majority of Americans or constituents who think that. Okay? The darker the red or the orange, the more people uh, say yes. The more blue, uh, the more uh, they, they don't believe it. They perceive low risk. Okay? Every single congressional district. Okay, will global warming harm people in the U.S.? Well, not so much. Will global warming harm me personally? Okay. All right. How about back to the solutions? Clean energy. Everybody supports this. I mean, this is really high, okay? Including the oil patches, including West Virginia. Okay, how about regulating CO2 as a pollutant? Not as strong, but still clearly majority support everywhere. How about setting strict CO2 limits on coal-fired power plants, which is basically the essence of the clean power plan? We didn't call it Obama's plan, but it's basically the clean power plan. Majority support everywhere. How about requiring fossil fuel companies to pay a carbon tax? Yeah, we use the word tax. All right, well, there's lots of others here. I'll just point to one other. Should schools be teaching about this? Yes. Everybody says yes. But how often do we talk about it? Not so often. And how often do we hear about it in the media? even less often, okay? And this is where I'll end, because this is one of the first things that anybody can do, is talk about it. In our work, we've identified this as what we call the spiral of silence, okay? That there is a perception that, let's say I want to talk about climate change, but I'm friends with Carol or, you know, we're related, right? And my perception is that she doesn't want to talk about climate change, or maybe she doesn't even believe it. So I'm not going to bring it up because I don't want to do, be uncomfortable, right? But in fact, she's interested in talking about climate change with me, but she has the same misperception about me too, okay? So she doesn't bring it up. And so I don't bring it up, and she doesn't bring it up, and so neither of us talk about it. And we all spiral downward into a spiral of silence and not talking about it. If you're not talking about a problem, how important can it be? And we've seen a couple really, I think, good examples of that shift on totally a different issues recently. Okay? Black Lives Matter and the Me Too movement. Now, leave aside your views about either of those. Does anybody think that issues about African Americans and their treatment by, uh, by police forces or sexual harassment and discrimination against women are new problems that we only just discovered three years ago? No, these are long-standing problems. Long-standing problems. But we weren't talking about it. Okay? That's why it's so important to begin by talking about it. Okay? So with that, thank you very much, and let's talk about it. Um, so I would just say, first of all, uh, Tony, thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. I think we should all sign up for one of your classes. Um, what fun that would be. And this was really, really interesting. There were several questions that I had that you actually kind of touched on, a whole variety of them. But let's open it up for your questions. This is a great chance to think about this as a seminar where you've got the professor here and you can just go at it. So um, when you ask your question,
question, could you just wait for the microphone so that we can make sure that those folks who are listening online um, are able to hear the question. Okay, let's start up here and then we'll work our way around. Right, and here you. comes the microphone. Um, do you, can you just you. tell me who you are? And oh, um, my name is Julie Selker. I'm not affiliated with any okay. congressional office. Hi. Um, hi. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. It was uh, so interesting. Do you have any explanations for why the support for solutions is so much stronger than the belief in the problem? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, okay. A lot of this comes down to values. Okay, so I didn't touch on it, but I'm going to, I'm going to take a little bit of time to really get at it because it's, it's important. So this is deeper than being a Democrat or Republican. It's deeper than being conservative or liberal. That what we have found in our work over the years is that what really seems to be driving a lot of this is a conflict over two different worldviews, essentially, two different value systems. Uh, the one is what, the first that we call is what we call egalitarianism. Okay? People with strong egalitarian values, as in they say there's too much discrimination in society, that government should be trying to eradicate poverty, that inequities of wealth between and across nations is a major source of conflict. None of those have anything directly to do with climate change, but people with that worldview are much more worried about climate change because in no small part they see it as a deeply unfair and unjust issue. Okay? The people who have benefited from the burning of fossil fuels are not the people who are getting hit first and worst and are going to pay the ultimate price. Okay? Um, so that's on the alarm side. But on the dismissive side, what we see is a different worldview, which is what we call individualism. So for these people, the one value that trumps, sorry, no pun intended, <laughs> that trumps all other values is individual liberty, individual freedom, individual autonomy, and that's usually cast as anti-government. Okay? The government's the enemy. It's too big, it's too intrusive, too much taxes, too much I mean, you know this discourse, right? We, we, it's all around. Um, people with that worldview are deeply suspicious and even hostile to the issue of climate change because it's, at least to them so far, they have interpreted it as, an, as a direct threat to those underlying values, which were there long before climate change came along. Okay? This is actually one of the deepest philosophical, but not, but deeply practical questions in American life, going back to before the founding, which is the question, what is the proper role of government in a society of free individuals? We have been wrestling with that question for well over 200 years, okay? And we still struggle with that question, okay? Now, if you have a worldview where the government is inherently too big to channel Grover Norquist. I want to shrink government to the size I can drown it in a bathtub. Okay? If that's your worldview, then into that milieu comes this issue, climate change, which is like the ultimate collective action problem of the mother of all collective action problems. Because there's no way that you and I and every other American, by doing those good things that will make you healthier and wealthier and you know, more comfortable and so on, of you know, changing your diet a little bit, uh, buying a more fuel-efficient car, buying f uh, energy-efficient appliances, insulating your attic. Please insulate your attic. I know it's not sexy, but do it. Um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? If we all do that, I've got colleagues who've calculated this and say that if all Americans did that, we could collectively reduce U.S. national emissions by about 10%. And that would be an amazing contribution. Okay? There is no silver bullet. Okay? We need a portfolio of approaches here. So... I'm not dismissing this, but it's only 10%, right? The other 90% has to come from larger systemic change. And the main mechanism we have for achieving social aims remains government. Government is going to have to be involved at some level, along with private sector, along with the public sector, along with the nonprofit sector, right? This is an all-hands-on-deck moment. But there's got to be some role for government, and we can have a big argument about what that should be, but there's going to have to be. And moreover, even if we get it all figured out here in the United States, we still don't solve the problem because it's a global problem, right? We have to do this in partnership, in coordination with 190 plus other countries in the world. And what's the main institution we have for coordinating international action? The United Nations. 
Well, as soon as you say that word, there are some people in the dismissive conspiracy camp who have visions of black helicopters in their head, right? They say, oh my God, climate change is just a, an excuse to try to take away American sovereignty, okay? So that's what I'm saying, is that this ultimately becomes a conflict over values, which was a long way of setting up my real answer to your question, which is why do some of these same people support clean energy? So the best way to answer that is with a story. Uh, in the state of Georgia several years ago, there's a single uh, utility that uh, dominates the electricity market. Okay? It's a monopoly, Georgia Power. Uh, and I highly recommend mo monopolies. If you can get one, get it. Okay? It's a great business model. <laughs> and they had basically set up the system so that homeowners who had solar panels on their roof were not allowed to sell that electricity into the grid. Why would you want the competition? Okay. So in Georgia, in response, the Sierra Club partnered with the Atlanta Tea Party. Maybe I should say that again. The Sierra Club partnered with the Tea Party to fight those regulations and beat them twice. And now homeowners can, in fact, sell their electricity into the grid. Now, why on earth would they do this? Okay, Sierra Club, easy, bunch of greeny tree huggers, care about climate change and panda bears, right? We know why they did it. Why? would the Tea Party do it? Many of whom don't believe in climate change because it's about individual liberty. It's about self-reliance. Who is the, some company or the government tell me what I can and cannot do with my castle? Why shouldn't I be able to participate in the free market with the energy I'm producing on my roof? Okay? That is the art of politics. How do you find policies that completely opposite bedfellows or just different bedfellows can come to support for different reasons and that's okay. Okay? Now those two groups have actually gone on to find other things that they agree on. They don't agree about lots of stuff but they have found other stuff and so I mean the nice thing is that they're now affectionately being called and wait for it the Green Tea Party. Okay? Okay? So really I, I devote the time because it's a great question it really gets at the deeper struggle of what this is all about because what you what you end up with is what's called solution aversion that people hear solutions that seems to violate their core ideological principles and therefore they reject the problem right i don't want more i, I don't want big government and climate change sure sounds like big government to me so then i'm it can't be true it's just an excuse by al gore and his friends you know to push their their liberal agenda down my throat. Okay? It's really easy to do that. The last point I'll make is that messenger matters. Messenger is often more important than the message. Because as human beings, we're just lousy at distinguishing among people. So let's take Al Gore as a wonderful example. I think Al Gore has done an amazing job activating the Democratic base. I think he's done a really good job internationally. But for every person, every Democrat he's managed to engage, there's at least one, if not more, conservatives that just go the opposite direction because they don't like him. They really, really don't like him. We see this in our surveys. Okay? Um, and unfortunately, as human beings, we're just lousy at saying, I loathe and detest Al Gore, that liberal politician. But when he's talking about climate science, he's actually got a point. Okay? It's just, we're just bad at that. Okay? And so that's why I think one of the most exciting things happening today is all the new voices that are coming into this issue, including Republicans, including conservatives, but not limited to them. Military officials, doctors, nurses, uh, businesses large and small, mayors, governors, uh, farmers, ranchers, faith leaders. I mean, this issue is now engaging people from every walk of life. And I think that is probably our best hope because it starts to break us out of this stupid political gridlock. The climate system does not care whether you're a Democrat or Republican. It's not like the floods that are destroying much of the Great Plains right now are only harming the farms of you know, liberal farmers and not conservative ones. The climate system doesn't care. Our policy making, though, does care. So... That's the tough one. Sorry, that was a okay. long answer. Okay, so we'll work our way around. We'll start up here. Uh, and, and I would just say, just to add one more little kind of data point, is that um, an, uh, we had a sustainable energy coalition that uh, commissioned polls every year through the 90s. 
And one of the things that we always found was that there was enormous support for renewables and energy efficiency uh, policies. And a lot of that we found was really tied because what people, people also really care about clean air and clean, environment, and clean water because it directly affects their health. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Hi there, thanks for this talk. Sure. My name is Megan May from Senator Baldwin's office. Okay. I'm interested in learning a little bit about what your assumptions for the model are and then where you published and how we can get access to those. So I think the quickest way to do that is come up afterwards and let's have let's geek out and uh, and I'll give you the paper. <laughs> yeah. Terrific. Okay. Uh, let's go over here and then we'll work our way back. Hi, I'm Hi. Fred Hoover with the NASIO State Association of uh, uh, the National Association of State Energy Officials. Back to your first slide. Uh, the, the percentage for um, the concern that Americans had for global warming, which is 71% in 2008, and then dropped. Yes. And you sort of alluded to. So I guess my question is, did it drop because Congress actually took action on climate change and there was a reaction to that, or is it some other reason? That's part of it. So. Um, Thanks for the question. Um, so there were a lot of things happening in that time period, right? You might remember this little thing called the Great Recession. Uh, the housing bubble popped, unemployment surged over 10%. Uh, we also had a couple cold weather events. Uh, you might remember we coined the term Snowmageddon back then. We're running out of these, <laughs> these phrases. Um, but we actually did a whole in-depth analysis that we published a couple years ago where we tested all of those potential explanations. And it turns out none of those had any effect. The, Unemployment, the economy, no real effect. Uh, change in housing prices, no association. Um, the ex cold weather didn't explain anything. The change in media coverage didn't really explain much. Uh, the thing that really seemed to do it was, I'm going to use a political science term here. I'll explain what I mean. It's a fancy term called political elite cues, okay? which goes back to what we were just talking about with messenger effects. That what happens in that critical time period is the rise of the Tea Party. And just to remind you, 10 years ago, the nominee of the Republican Party for President of the United States was Senator John McCain, who for years had been one of the primary champions of climate legislation here in Congress. And moreover, climate change was in the National Republican Party platform. That it's real, that it's human cause, it's serious, and we're going to solve it with our conservative principles. Just two years later, with the rise of the Tea Party, John McCain goes silent. Lindsey Graham goes silent. Lamar Alexander goes silent. And many other Republicans in Congress who already knew that this was a serious problem. But they went quiet because suddenly they were afraid of being primaried. Okay? And we see the entire Republican Party take this strong lurch away from in 2008 saying, yes, this is our national party stance that this is a serious problem to all the way out to the last twig on the end of the longest branch and where it became a common talking point to say climate, climate change is a hoax. Okay? And what we've been seeing is them slowly inching their way back up that branch. Okay? They're not back to where they were, not yet. But they have been beginning to inch their way back. So the, the key point here is that when political leaders speak, their partisans, the followers, okay, tend to listen. Because most Americans aren't I break it to any of my climate science friends in the audience, they're not reading your peer-reviewed papers. Okay? They're not reading the IPCC reports. We've even asked. Only 14% of Americans say they've ever heard of the IPCC, and I think many of them are lying. <laughs> okay? Okay? We're not talking to climate scientists over the backyard fence. Okay? Most of us are only learning about this through the media, and in particular what we're hearing political leaders saying about it. Now that's shifting back to this point again of that the conversation is greatly expanded now to a whole bunch of new voices that aren't just political leaders. But nonetheless, people do tend to follow the, the leaders that they hear talking about it, and when they say that it's a hoax, they tend to fall in line. So. Great. Uh, here. Hello. Um, I'm Nick Heyman from Washington State Senator Maria Cantwell's office. Oh. Um, it was an amazing talk, thank you, first thank of all. I really liked your analogy with the Black Lives Matter Me Too, that made a lot of sense. I feel like they really found 
their wind on social media before they got into the media. Yeah. How much do you think we can rely on the media and rely on that tactic to push this issue forward? Oh, God. Um, it's, a good question. it's a very good question. Uh, look, we live in an ever more complicated and fragmented media landscape than ever before. I mean, I will confess to being an old fogey in this room. I, I remember when there were just three major networks when most of America watched one guy named Walter Cronkite who literally would say at the end of each day's broadcast, and that's the way it is. I mean, can you imagine somebody having the gall to say, and that's the way it is after a half hour program? Uh, we, that's, that was such a different world. Okay? Um, I think, but on the other hand, what it means is that while it's increasingly hard to have a, a consensus conversation in the way that we did back then because there was so few sources of information and we were basically all having the same conversation, that's true. On the other hand, we're a far more interactive and complicated media and communication landscape than ever before. And I'll just point to AOC as just a, the most recent case in point. Okay? Here is somebody who has managed to figure out how to use social media to go from, you know, literally, you know, unknown quantity to a, a, a member of Congress and now one of the most uh, listened to members of Congress because of the power of social media. That was something nobody saw coming, okay? And, you know, Trump himself is a, is a creature of a different uh, media uh, uh, background, of course, from uh, reality TV. My point here is that I think the messages, the things that take off, the virality can come from lots of different places now. And the mainstream media still plays an absolutely critical role in that as well. It turns out mainstream media stories are one of the most shared things on social media. Okay? So it's not just the really great blogger who says the really killer, nasty burn on somebody right, that goes viral. It's also mainstream reporting. So, um, so anyway, I, I don't think it's possible or easy, anyway, to predict where, where conversations are really going to kick off. Okay, back here first. Hi there. Uh, again, thank you for your time. My name is Francisco Esquerra. I'm from Office Representative Mike Levin. Um, and I guess my first question is in regards to, you spoke on Latinos being uh, uh, essentially caring a lot about climate change. Yeah. It's being very crucial to it. I was hoping if you could speak to the specific factors that contribute to that trend. Um, I would just love to learn more. Thank yeah, you. so would I. Um, so let me just uh, kind of underscore this particular finding a bit because with the Gallup World Poll data that we did, so again, 130 countries around the world, one of the things that just totally stunned us is that when we asked people around the world um, how much of a personal threat do you think climate change is, every single country in Central and South America just leaps off the map, uh, much more concerned about climate change than anywhere else, more than North America, more than Europe, more than Africa, more than Asia, more than Australia, I mean, certainly more than Antarctica, uh, but that doesn't count. Uh, though actually the people in Antarctica are pretty concerned about climate change, um, not to mention the penguins. So, uh, so what we're finding is not limited to the United States. It seems to be something bigger, and to be honest, when I look at that, those set of results, my interpretation is that it's something cultural that there's something about Latino culture, okay, and Brazilian culture too, for that matter, uh, that is just somehow engaged with this. And so one of the things that we're actually working on right now is trying to really disentangle this. And so far what it seems to be is actually it's society. It's just like it's embedded in the society. It's in the social relationships and the family relationships and the extended relationships back to home countries. Uh, it's part of just the underlying culture and expectations of and social norms that, that Latinos grow up in. Okay? Look at me. I'm not a Latino, right? I'm an outsider trying to understand. Um, but everyone, all my friends in that community say, yeah, that's pretty much how life is. Okay? That's just the way we, we expect things to be. Okay? So uh, what we're finding is that it's no one thing. It's actually the whole constellation of, of that community. Okay? With, by the way, and let's just also say that there are divergences and differences within the Latino community, right? Cuban Americans are not the same as Mexican Americans, which are not the same as others. So we have to recognize the diversity there as well. Okay. We'll take a couple more questions. Uh, one in the back, then we'll go over, oh, like four more questions. Okay. 
Hi, um, Hi. my name is Megan. I'm from Senator Bennett's office. Uh, you yeah. talked about the Black Lives Matter movement and the Me Too movement. Yeah. Do you think that there's going to be a movement like that for climate change? And what do you think is going to spur that, especially in the United States, since many people, as you said, like, don't believe it's going to directly affect them? Oh, such a great question. Um, so first of all, I will just say my crystal ball is cloudy. Okay, uh, back to this other question. I, I mean, it can come from lots of different places. I think it's even possible we're seeing it starting to emerge right now. Um, and not just Sunshine, which has clearly managed to push uh, you know, their particular idea, the Green New Deal, and you know, if nothing else, everybody's talking about it. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Everybody's talking about it. Uh, even Tauntauns and Luke Skywalker are talking about it. Okay? Um, but the other one I would absolutely keep my eye on right now is, um, is the student strike movement. Okay? There were over, I think, something like two million kids around the world that went on strike just a couple weekends ago. Okay? Uh, I think that's pretty damn powerful. Um, I mean, we'll see. We'll see what happens. We've seen movements like that come and they fade away. But I think they're also learning from prior movements as well. But I think those are really more reflections of a deeper sense of engagement and desire for action that we're beginning to see in that larger concept that I was talking about, the issue public of the alarmed. People are increasingly like, we need to get going here. Okay? And so I think they're going to respond to candidates who are leading on this. I think they're going to respond to business leaders that are doing this. In fact, I just saw, I think today, that uh, the big giant tech companies, the Googles and the Facebook and so on, just created a new association of companies who are purchasing 100% clean energy. Okay? Um, I, I think there are market forces that are going to come into this. I think there's consumer pressure forces that are going to come into this. I think there's religious forces. In fact, we did a whole study on the impact of Pope Francis when he came to the United States, and he had an effect. We called it the Francis effect. Um, uh, this is coming from lots of different places. So I, I don't think it's going to be one thing that is the match that just <laughs> does it. Uh, but I am saying that the wood is pretty dry and there's pretty, even probably a fair amount of, well, I don't want to use the analogy of petroleum product on the, on the wood. But anyway, you get the point. Okay. okay. We'll take two last questions here and here. Okay. Uh, hi. My, my name is Jette Finzen. I'm with Congressman Cartwright. Um, in Pennsylvania. And I'm curious, it sounds like from what you are saying here that in terms of communications from the policymaker side that we need to focus on solutions that are not so from the top or how do you, what are your recommend, rec recommendations for talking about it as a policymaker that you can reach more audiences and we don't turn them away, they don't get to worry but they also see solutions. So I, I'm not saying that the solutions are only like getting individuals to do stuff. And in fact, I would, I personally would warn against that. I mean, it's where Americans' head tends to go first because we are such an individualistic society is that people tend to say, oh, well, I recycle. Okay. Okay, great. You recycle. I, I love it. And I hope you take your shopping bags, you know, reusable shopping bags at the grocery store. That's not going to solve this problem. Okay. If I can get the public to do anything, it's the issue public is to became, is to get active politically. That to me is like that that's more important than all the other stuff, as important as that other stuff actually is. So in terms of communicating to your constituents, one, I would just encourage them to speak up. Okay, I, I think really that, uh, coming back to that to that key point. I would encourage them to do the things in their own life that they can to try to make their own contribution. And I would really encourage them to start putting more pressure on other political leaders, including maybe even your own boss. Um, now, in terms of the policies that we ultimately are putting forward at the federal level, at the state level, at the local level, all of those need efforts. I mean, I think actually citizens can have enormous influence on especially those local conversations, right? The, the local PUC, your Public Utility Commission, they rarely hear from, from the members of the public. So the public actually has way more power, I think, to affect change at those local levels. But let's not under estimate their effect on our national politics as well. Now, in terms of what policies, I mean, we can, I mean, we have a long conversation of, you know, how much do they like carbon taxes and how much do they like cap and dividend and, you know, uh, you know, 
uh, cap and trade type mechanisms versus carbon taxes and efficiency standards and all those things I think are ultimately going to be important. People don't really distinguish that much in the general public. Um, I think they're mostly looking for people who are saying, this is a serious problem and we're, I'm going to be a champion. Okay? I'm going to lead on this. Um, the details is what we hire political leaders to do. Okay, and right over here. Hi, uh, Sullivan Gassman. I work with uh, Congresswoman Norton. Uh, safe to say Washington, D.C. would be a very affected area by uh, climate change, but I was actually wondering uh, regarding some of the charts about uh, opinion and concern. You showed us that a lot of those countries uh, in the Midwest, uh, very inland countries, uh, is where concern is the lowest. And I was just wondering uh, if that was simply due to these are red states and as, the, as you said, the Tea Party controls a lot of the opinion there, or if there's a sentiment that they're feeling removed from the problem. And if so, how would we overcome that? Yeah. Um, really, most of it is politics. These are very conservative parts of the country. And so it's not just the oil patch. It's, of course, it's Nebraska, right? There's not a lot of oil in Nebraska. Um, and yet people are generally pretty conservative there. And again, if what you're hearing from your political leaders is that climate change is not real or it's not human cause or it's a hoax, then people tend to listen to and fall in line with that. That said, we've done work already in, uh, in basically trying to engage people in these states and finding that actually it's not that hard. If you connect climate change to things that they actually care about. I know this is like rocket science here. Okay? But we have found, for instance, we, we do a national radio program called Climate Connections. Uh, I'd encourage you to come visit. Uh, it plays every day, 90 seconds, minute and a half story, brand new and every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, that plays on uh, over 470 stations across the country, plus 136 Spanish-speaking uh, stations. Um, and one of the stories that we did was about a Nebraska uh, a senator, state senator, who was deeply concerned about the potential impacts of climate change on corn. Okay? So we looked at the, we broadcast this on social media as well as not just the radio program and found it did really well nationally. Like, I was like, agriculture? Really? It's corn, people. I mean, and yet it, people got really interested in this. So we said, well, how would it work in Nebraska? So we tried it in Nebraska. Phenomenally well, okay, 10 out of 10. So then we were like, well, is that because the story is about Nebraska or because it's about corn? So we then tested it in Iowa, Illinois, uh, Colorado, and uh, Oklahoma, some of which have corn, some of which do not. And sure enough, it did just as well in Iowa as it did in Nebraska. And I can tell you as a person from the Big Ten, Iowa and Nebraska do not get along in lots of reasons, okay? Um, I'm from Iowa. Oh, great. <laughs> My, my father was from Iowa, so, and my mother was from Nebraska. Hey, how about that? Uh, so anyway, um, I'm living proof that two can work together. Um, so it was corn, okay? It was connecting climate change to something that they care deeply about for obvious reasons, okay? Uh, that's the larger lesson, is why we call it climate connections, you need to connect the dots for people between this thing that they've kind of heard about climate change, but it's never been connected to anything else that they care about. To the extent that people think about climate change, and I, I didn't even do this, but we asked this question in a very free association kind of way. We know what people are thinking of when they hear that word. They mostly think of things like melting ice, okay? which isn't particularly mobilizing, right? When was the last time you felt dread watching ice melt? Okay? That's not real motivating. Okay? What people do not do right now is connect climate change with human health. And yet, when we look at the actual impacts of climate change, that's one of the things we're most worried about. Okay? Asthma, allergies, infectious diseases, and then all the negative physical and mental effects of extreme weather events, okay? which are devastating. Okay? But people have never connected those dots before, okay? let alone climate change and corn. Okay? So that's what I would encourage all of you to do, and if you're working for a member, to ask them to be trying to find those voices, not themselves necessarily, but voices within their district 
that can help tell those stories of here's how climate change is affecting me, and even more importantly, here's what I'm doing as an example, as a role model within your district of what I'm doing to take action to solve it, because those stories are everywhere. No. And on the note of talking about solutions, I just wanted to mention, I hope that you all picked up this little brochure outside because EESI is launching a whole new effort around a program that was in, uh, that was just reauthorized in the farm, in the farm bill that provides zero interest loans to rural electric cooperatives. So this is all about helping rural America make energy efficiency community solar, community storage uh, uh, initiatives available to rural America ac across the country. So it's one more piece of how we can address issues around climate, bring solutions to people who really need them. So please take a look at this. And I also just wanted to mention that we're doing another thing that's related to solutions, folks, is this briefing we've got next Monday with Bloomberg New Energy Finance and the Business Council for Sustainable Energy that's really looking at what we are seeing in terms of investments in clean energy across the country. And as Tony was saying, you know, there is an awful lot going on, and it's really incumbent upon us to make sure that we know about it and your so important point that we talk about it. So I just want to say, what a terrific job. It, thank you so much. This was like wonderful. Thanks so much, George. Thank you. Thank you.